There's this myth that the rugged individualist should be the idol of our age. That a pair of bootstraps and self-determination are all a person needs. But there's another way to view the world. As John Donne said, no man is an island, and I believe we're meant to be connected. This series is my attempt to showcase the people I know and love who are building communities with creativity and passion. People from around the country who are working on building a stronger bond between people. I want to show that we don't arrive at the beloved community through grand actions or sweeping legislation, but through the daily commitment to positive action by the people around us. From all the depictions in movies and television, I was expecting to walk onto a college campus frenetic with activity. Kids partying on the grass outside their homes, campus-wide events to entertain students, and social activists carrying signs calling for a better campus and a better country. At Elmira College, I got only a little bit of that. Sure, there was a lot of great energy, which I saw from my days of freshman orientation, when we sang songs and played games to distract ourselves from the fact that we had a new home. People had a lot of fun ways to spend their time with the hard work of student clubs, but there weren't more than a handful of people trying to amplify the voices of social idealism. That changed with Raven C. I got to know Raven through WECW, our campus radio station. She co-hosted a show that specialized in indie, but Bob Dylan always had a home there. Raven adores that man from Minnesota whose words shaped the consciousness, both political and personal, of so many. And it's those two worlds in which Raven has worked so hard. Her study of English literature, from the beats to critical theory, brought her to leading deep conversations around the dining hall dinner table. Those conversations were with friends she loved, and she challenged them to think differently, especially about feminist issues. When debates were raging about female contraceptives in the national arena, Raven put together a video to raise campus awareness about the issue. And that passion for amplifying the feminist voice has only gotten stronger, the past year has seen Raven create a repository for information about female beat writers, which has become known by the larger critical beat community, as well as began working at a foundation in Boston that helps organizations dedicated to making the world a better place. In the land of revolution and civil disobedience, Raven is working as part of a new era of social progress. Well, originally I am from Belle Vernon, Pennsylvania, which is a suburb of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. One of four kids, technically. My, well, my mom was married once before my dad, so I have an older half-brother who is actually uh, bringing my fourth nephew into the world soon. He only makes boys, apparently. Um, and then my, I have an older sister, Megan. I'm the middle child, so always trained to bring peace to the household. Um, and then Luke, who also went to Elmira with me, um, is my Irish twin, so for four days of the year, we're the same age. And then my mom's always been from Pennsylvania. My granddad was a miner in the steel mills of Pennsylvania. And then my grandma, um, well, didn't work most of her life, never drove a car. I still don't do that either. <laughs> but I've gotten a lot farther than she ever traveled. Um, and then my dad was from West Virginia, but um, he met my mom because he ran track for my uncle. And so that's how they ended up together. She's 12 years older. I don't know if I ever told you that story, but they uh, wrote letters to each other for years because she met him when he was like 15 and they were family friends. So they wrote letters for like seven years and finally he was like, I'm in love with you. And uh, became, they ended up giving it a shot and oh God, 30 years later, here we are. My family's always been really important. And, and I think that comes from my mom more than anyone. 
Um, my mom is one of those people that always says she was meant to be a mom. She says the same thing about her dad, who my granddad that I mentioned before who worked in the steel mills. I, I never had the chance to meet him. He died of cancer when my mom was 20. Um, but he, I always like to think, like, because I really, I, you know, I'm into Jack Kerouac and those guys, and he's, you know, always, had, he sounds like a very, like, he sang Woody Guthrie songs, and, and he loved folk music, and, um, you know, loved Halloween and holidays, and, and a lot of that I know through my mom, who tells the best stories. She just has these great stories about what it was like to be a kid, and, like, growing up in the 1950s and into the 60s, and, and I mean, she was one of six that lived in a house that her dad built with his own hands, and she always used to say they... They never had any money, like they were always poor, but her dad was always the one that took all of the all of the neighborhood kids in a car to go get them ice cream, like even though they were the poorest family on the block. And I think that was sort of a culture my mom continued. Like my dad's a social worker, my mom's a nurse, so we never had a lot of money, but we were always the house that everybody loved to come to. We were like the central, kind of like we had bonfires all the time, Luke and I had birthday parties. We were the place where you could get away with watching our movies and eating candy um, when your parents wouldn't let you because I mean, it might not have been the best thing for you, but people people loved being there. And so, yeah, it started like we were always... My mom laughs at me now because she tells me I should hang a shingle outside on the, on the, on the house because that's apparently what it used to say when you were like the inn or you were taking in whoever off the street. Um, and that's sort of how I've always been, but I think it started... I think it started with my grandma and, and then my mom because at my grandma's house so she lived right down the hill from us we live in a house like right right near the house that like my granddad built so family has always been important um and she's always taking in family somebody that's you know hard up they lost their job or the, the car broke down or whoever needs something grandma's there and it was always everybody's welcome and my parents always had an attitude about you know very judgment-free zone, always just helping people, and I think that's sort of something I picked up from them. And I mean, I remember in college, my freshman year, we we put six name tags on the door because of girls who were unhappy with their roommates, or and you know I wasn't an RA yet, but I might as well have been because I know it was me and Rosie lived together, but. Donna and her roommate didn't get along, so Donna was in my room. There was permanently an air mattress blown up. And so it was sort of like the, the next phase of like what home had been where, you know, all my friends were always there. Like when they were having a bad time, they slept on my couch. Now it was the dorm room. And then as I became an RA, it was sort of like, okay, everybody, I, now I have a floor. And since I moved to Boston, I have the apartment. And anytime I can put people up, I mean, I do it. <laughs> and, I, and I think as much as my mom makes fun of me for it, I think it's something I learned from the way I grew up. I mean, I feel like I kind of live with a with sense of impermanence. I don't really have that idea of, of being in one place forever kind of thing. Um, and I don't, I don't feel like I ever have a sense of this, like, well, this is my space and it needs to stay a certain way. Like, I think it, there's just a lot of fluidity to it. And I think that's something that sort of, like, became attractive to me about the beats. And so, obviously, some things about, like, the way I model the space I live in are sort of inspired by what I read. I mean, most things are. Being in, I mean, all of us are inspired by the culture we take in, but all, having always been a reader, um, as well as, you know, these other kind of things that influence me, books influence me a lot, and um, I love, I love transients. That's a weird thing to say, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot. Like I love, you know, the changing of the seasons. I love being in in motion. I, I, I kind of love the fact. I mean, it's bittersweet, but I love the fact that things don't stay the same. And so I think this is sort of another version of playing that out, like, you know, letting people sort of come and go and, and being here for them when I can. And and, uh, and I like to think it, and, and sometimes it sort of sounds weird and hippie, but I sort of like to think, like, you know, if I have it, I, I'm going to share it. Like, I've, that's always been an attitude of mine, and I think that's something that I learned from my parents. You know, we never had a lot, but what we did have, we shared, or, you know tried to give away, like, as much as we could. And so, like, that's, like, if I have a place, like, I need a great deal on this place. I love this apartment. Um, I have a ton of space. Like, why wouldn't I share that with the people that, you know, when Donna needed a place to crash or Meg Carpenter or, or Luke needs a place to put up 13 people or Bob Shep needs the, a place for the Amnesty kids to stay. Like, I get a lot of joy out of being able to 
to be that that place and it's and it's fun because I meet new people that way I mean it's probably not the safest thing I ever do because I mean on St. Patrick's Day I met an Australian guy and he was staying in a hostel I said no you're staying in my house come on over and my oh my mom's gonna kill me if she sees that um but anyway it's that's I don't know I, I like I like the idea like I, I find it I think it's fun I think it's I think I don't know I just kind of think that's a uh, way life should be and I think it just makes it, I mean, there's less pressure when, like, I mean, if you're so concerned about, like, oh, I have to, I have to have this thing, and it has to be this way, and, you know, you get so caught up in, in, trying, in trying to have that, that you miss out on, on what comes from, well, I'm getting beat again, but the, the experience of it. And, like, I like to think that, that should I ever be on the other end of it, you know, somebody will... It'll, you know, it pays back. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate of karma. I love the cloud cult's whole shtick about um, the law of thermodynamics. Sort of one, another way of thinking about reincarnation or energy. This sort of like no matter is ever just destroy or created or destroyed. It's always sort of cycling back. So, in sort of a scientific way, but also in sort of I guess a spiritual way. Like karma is one of those things. I guess I would say I'm invested in, and so. One way I always think about it is like, I don't know, I feel like it, whether it's luck or, or karma or both, I feel like in some ways in this sort of like hippy dippy way, the universe has got my back. So because they know I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I got everyone else's basically. <laughs> I mean like I've always considered myself a cynic, but in this way that like if I was really a cynic I wouldn't do the things that I do. This is one of the things that frustrates Bridget Sherry about me most because, um, I'm always ready to sort of, you know, say like, well, of course, you know, you can't trust, you know, certain, you know, aspects of the government or like, you know, I, I can't, I have my moments of like, I mean, I remember being in seventh grade and learning the de definition of cynical, doubting in the sincerity or goodness of others and being like, yes. <laughs> um, but at the same time, obviously I don't feel that way. Like I, um, I, I think people are, I, I guess the way I would put it most honestly is like, I think people are capable of more than you would ever expect in both positive and negative ways. I think people are capable of terrible hurtful things in a way that you would never deem imaginable. But I also think people are capable of amazing wonderful things in a way that you wouldn't ever imagine. So I think it goes both ways. I think positivity is so important. Like I just don't understand, I don't understand negative attitudes. Like it just, it's so, it's hard enough already to like go through life and deal with the shit that all of us are dealing with. And, and I mean, you just make it harder on yourself. Like, instead of thinking about like, hey, that, that what happened to me was awful, so now the world owes me something. Like, you then, then, then you start with a deficit. You sort of have this hole that you're just trying to fill up and, and you're never gonna get anywhere because you're never gonna get it filled, you know? Whereas if you think the other way, if you start it even and just build outward, you know? I don't know. You're gonna, you're gonna get a lot more done. Yeah. And I think I definitely think that you know the attitude has a lot to do with it because if, uh, again now we're gonna get theoretical, but having read a lot of theory, like perception is huge. I mean, like you know, I'm, I wouldn't say anything for certain, but like if reality, it, like is perception. I mean, that's a statement a lot of people want to make. A lot of theorists, in some ways, say or say one way or another. You know. It matters how you, how you approach the world. But I don't ever think, like, I don't believe in a concept of evil. Like, I don't, I think that's just an easy out. And I don't know if we're getting really far away from what you want to be talking about. But, yeah, that's <laughs> but, like, good. This is just one thing, like, I've been thinking about, I don't know, however, for whatever reason, a lot lately. But I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, with culture and the way things play out. But I don't, like, a lot of times, like, we just end up kind of hurting each other and not even meaning to. Like, it's not... It's not on purpose. It's not because like necessarily any one individual did something evil or and, and sometimes the the extent to which things happen do come seem like impossibly evil terrible things. But again, I think mental health is an issue we don't talk about or address nearly enough. Um, I don't know globally, but definitely in this country. Um, but anyway, I just think it's, you know, if anything, we're selfish, you know, and, and we're all just trying to, like, we're just trying to figure it out, and we're not really sure, you know, how we're affecting other people as we're doing it. Um, and I think that's where there's a lot of possibility for for hurt and negativity, and, and you know, 
where you see people capable of doing really harmful, hurtful things to one another. Um, and it's just like, again, like my love of transience and like, but it's, it's never black and white, you know, it's never like, well that, you know, like somebody who could be an amazing person is, is equally capable of, of car like hurting another person as somebody who comes off as more of an asshole and, and shitty, you know. It's, for me, a big thing is just honesty. Um, and not in a way where like, you always have to be like super honest about fact and um, there's a really great deer tick line that says, just because it's honest, it doesn't make it true. And I love that line because it's not so much about like this truth that you can get at and we can all agree on that it's true, but you can be honest about like what it is you think, what it is you feel, and the way you're seeing things. And I think that's so important in this whole concept of like having relationships with people at all. Because if you're not able to, one, be honest with yourself, and sometimes that's hard because you don't know, but then, then say that, you know, be honest about that with yourself that you don't know or you're unsure. And, and I, think, I think if we all kind of, sort of strive for that a little more, um, I don't know, I think the community building would be a lot easier. But that's scary. I mean, it's, it's hard and it's scary because you, then you have to admit things to yourself you don't want to admit and, and to other people that you don't want to necessarily don't even know how to to start to begin to approach but and I think that's true like building you know relationships at all kinds of levels whether they're friendships or romances or families or you know work relationships or whatever kind of community we're talking about at BC my second year I got to TA and I TA for a class called the City of an American Literature and Film and I TA for a Shakespeare class but I also taught for this program over the summer. Um, it was a writing program for students who had gotten into BC, um, but who they felt like needed some extra community building. And in all, and in all honesty, it is a it is a program for first generation immigrants, mostly students of color who come from difficult backgrounds and usually you know more poverty than because BC is a very privileged place. Um, one of my biggest frustrations with BC doesn't mean the kids are bad people. They're not, but they come from a certain, again, a certain way of looking at the world, a certain background, a certain, a certain amount of privilege um, that they don't already necessarily know how to navigate. And hopefully, part of college is learning about that. But um, the kids that are coming in in this program are kids that are already coming out of hardship. I mean, they're first generation immigrants, mostly first generation college students. So they're coming from families who, you know, have struggled to get here. And, and inevitably all of them have dealt with some serious conflict. I mean, one of our students um, had his family murdered in the Congo, you know, and was adopted and, and here he was at BC playing soccer. Um, and, you know, some of our students were from Nepal, which was really cool for me because I uh, just visited, well, I was about to visit there, which I got to do. And, um, but anyway, it was this really amazing opportunity to sit down with them and, and teach them English. Because for them, math was more important. So they had two like tracks, and there were English tutors and there were math tutors. And there were always a ton of kids at the math tutors. Because, you know, math, the grades are important. And the answer matters. You have to get the right answer. And if you want to be an engineer or a doctor, or you want to do something that's going to make money, inevitably you need math. That's a skill that's going to get you somewhere. And English is a lot harder to pin down, like obviously language. And, and so one of the challenges for them is a lot of them are, are second. English is a second language speaking student, so they're, they want to get their language good. They, they want to learn, learn English. They want to be better at using words. But they don't really think about literature in a way that's helpful. Um, so I remember one night when I sat down with two, I was at tutoring, nobody ever came to tutoring to the English tutors, but two students who were not in my class, but they were in one of the other classes, and you know all the students, very like community building program. But anyway, so I'm sitting down, these two kids come over and they're like, Raven, we gotta read these poems for tomorrow, like, we gotta come up with like what they're about, like, can you help us? And I was like, yeah, of course. So I was like, let's just sit down and like, let's read these poems. So they sit in, I mean, they're like two like athletic like guys, like, but, you know, pretty, like if we we're going to play gender stereotypes, like stereotypical guys, guys, they're athletes and, you know, they're nice kids. So we gave them all iPads for the program. So I, I have the iPad and we're reading the poem and it was William Carlos Williams, um, the, the Red Wheel Barrow. So they're just like, what the, 
is this about? Like, I have no idea. So we just took it line by line. And I'm just, you know, I'm like, okay. And I would read it out loud because that's part of the experience of poetry, in my opinion. And I would just make them react. I would say, okay, like, you know, what is that? What is this about to you? Like, and then I would just point at the way language was being used and say something like, okay, so, you know, what's the difference in choosing a word with like a positive connotation or a negative connotation? You know, you, you well, you know, the way you, you use a word it matters, right? Because it has it has a whole history. It has a connotation. You know, you, uh, and of course, I can't think of an example right now. But like, uh, uh, you know. Two words that seem like they could be about the same thing, like, you know, m can mean entirely different things. And so I was trying to get them in the experience of saying, like, okay, we replace this word, like, how does that, how does that change it? And, and so we just kind of played with this poem for maybe 20 minutes, and, and it was like me sort of just prompting them to react. And so we got to the end of it, and they had all of these ideas about it, and ideas that, like, I mean, maybe nobody had ever brought up about the red wheelbarrow before, or maybe they were stereotypical ones, but in some ways, you know, matter more than it, than mine, sitting there as an, an English grad student who's read this poem a million times and kind of regurgitate to you what critics say it's about, because they have, they're coming from these totally different experiences and backgrounds and bringing that to their reading of this, because the way they understand language and symbols is based on, you know, the, the experience of their lives. And like that was, and, and I was trying to get them to see that, you know, and so they get to the end of the poem and they're like, yeah, well, but what do we say when we go into class tomorrow? Like, what is it about? And I was like, everything you just said to me. And they're like, but can we really say that? Like, isn't it about something? And I was like, yeah, but wait, what it's about is your experience reading it. You know, like, there's nobody that can tell you that, that the way you just read this poem is wrong. I mean, somebody could say there's a, a more accurate reading based on, you know, if we're trying to talk about what the author thinks. Or, but I was like, I can tell you for a fact what your teacher wants is what we just, what we just did here. Like, she wants to hear your perspective on this. And it was like, no one had ever told them this. You know, that, that, there, that there didn't have to be a right answer, first off. That was shocking. They were like, you mean wait, there isn't an answer? And I was like, no, <laughs> like mind blowing. There isn't one answer. You know, it's all about your experience with it. But it took me like sort of having that. And it was great because, you know, they walked away from it really empowered. And, and it was really amazing for me to watch happen because it really, after two years of academia and six years of college English, I sort of forgot what I was doing in the first place. You know, like, what was it about books that made me want to do this? Because I was so burnt out on it. And that's really easy. That happens a lot in academia because it becomes this really frustrating space where it becomes about, it comes about being competitive research. It becomes about showing, like, showmanship and one-upping each other and, and, um, and not about teaching at all. But for me, this was like, <laughs> this was like, they were teaching, you know, I know it all, it's sort of stereotypical and cheesy, but they sort of like reminded me of why I was here in the first place, because it showed the importance of, of just sitting down with poem and how empowering that can be, because this was the first place where they were being told, like, your voice matters, you know? Like, it doesn't, it's not about me telling you what the answer is so you can tell your professor, it's about you responding to it, and that's what's important, is, is your voice and your perspective. And no one had ever told them that before. And here was a poem that could show them that. And then I really got to thinking about that when I was kind of like reviewing like, oh God, I hated grad school. And like, why was I even here? And then when I was like kind of sitting back down and thinking, okay, like why did I get into this in the first place? I realized like, that's what I think books did for me and what I wanted to be able to do for other people. When you're a kid, when you're learning about things, you just sort of like, you're learning that there are certain ways the world is. Um, but when you read, that's the closest thing you can get to, to say, traveling or really inhabiting someone else's perspective. I can never understand what it is to be disabled or to be a person of color or, you know, to be gay or lesbian, like, because these are not, this is not who I am. But by reading the works of those people and stories about that are from perspectives of other people, other cultures, like I get a real sense of, of empathy. Like you learn empathy, you learn um, so much just from books. And then like traveling is an, I guess another version of that for me of actually like being, but I mean traveling, it comes from a posi position of privilege as well. Like I'm lucky to be able to travel the places I have and visit the places I have. but. But reading is a, is, a, is a way to sort of do all that and begin to learn that from a young age.
Um, and I, and it, it took me like sitting down with those students and watching this happen for them to, to, to remember or even realize that that's what this was about for me. So what I'm really interested in figuring out is what, what, I don't want to say academia because I, I had a really like hard time when I sat down and realized like this wasn't it, this isn't for me, when all along I thought it was going to be, that I was, you know, I was going to be a professor, I was going to be an academic, that made sense. And, uh, and it was like sort of like, okay, who am I if I'm not an academic? And then what I had to separate out was like sort of intellectualism and academia. And like, inevitably, I'm always going to be an intellectual. Um, and that sounds sort of douchey. But I mean it in a way that like, I can't sit down any, like anymore and I don't even know when the last time was and watch a movie without analyzing it. You know, like, I don't, I think, I think about culture in a way that I'm always thinking about the way, it, how the way it's shaping perspective and and I'm thinking I I enjoy reading Chris Davin psychoanalytic theory and I enjoy I mean I, I enjoy reading the beats for like the emotional response I have to them but also through a critical perspective I love analyzing you know from a historical cultural perspective and a feminist perspective why texts matter and like these are all sort of intellectual pursuits or that's how we would describe them and I want to keep doing that I don't want to stop um, and, and I don't really know how to stop sort of being that person. But I'm really interested in thinking about what intellectualism looks like outside of the institution anymore. Like, what does it look like to bring intellectualism to the streets? I mean, Allen Ginsberg famously said he was bringing poetry back to the streets. And so I'm interested in bringing intellectualism back to the streets. You know, like, the salons. Of, and, and some of it is partly, like, self-indulgent. But some of it, I think, is, like... I mean, it, and it, it's the kind of stuff like the, um, oh, Aaron, blanking on his last name, the whole case with JSTOR and MIT. Um, and I mean, here a young man died over trying to make knowledge accessible, you know, like, and I think that's such an important thing. Um, not that I like it, you know, JSTOR has got to make their money or whatever, but it's become this so inclusive, like knowledge has become a commodity. Um, if you know, you know the the university instead of being like this outputter of of culture and knowledge has sort of become this bastion of keeping it away you know like you have to get into these doors to have access to these things like i like luckily elmira because i still have an elmira email address i can access databases so i can do work on my blog and stuff but without that i wouldn't have access to these things unless i belong to a university or i wanted to pay exorbitant amounts of money and like that seems absurd to me because some of what's published on there is people like me, you know, like, who are working their asses off to make a name for themselves so they can get into the right PhD program and God knows maybe one day have a job because this is what they think it is they want. Um, and I, and, and then other people have to pay to, or, or belong to a specific university to have access to my work. Like, that's absurd, which is one of the reasons I started the blog in the first place. So I have a blog called womenofthebeatgeneration.tumblr.com, and it started out of this place of thinking about access, um, and also thinking about, like, I mean, I think these women are hugely important, and that, that was the other thing about academia. I kind of got, not literally laughed at, but people were like, the beats really? You, you study the beats. Um, okay. And so they're, they're a really interesting group because they're sort of canonized and they're gaining this scholarly cred and there's all these people in the U.S. right now um, really doing a lot of important work on building a scholarly understanding of beat studies and I think it's important and great. But at the same time it's like they're like they're trying so hard to make it so scholarly because they want to prove that the, be the beats belong there. But the beats are great because they're like and they make it impossible to have them belong to the institution because they never will. You know, they're the guys that, and girls who dropped out of the institutions, you know, who, who are both intellectuals because they're citing Whitman and they've read Pound and Elliot and they have college degrees and they're mostly middle class white, though there are um, a myriad of other voices that are just now coming to light of, you know, all kinds of other beat writers who are working in this tradition, but the ones we think of iconically, like Kerouac and Ginsburg and Burroughs and even Diane and Diane de Prima and Joyce Johnson, they're these kind of middle class white um, voices who are becoming really frustrated with, you know, in the 1950s already with the way the way they see like intellectualism in the, in the university and they're sort of dropping out to, to figure it out in another way. And so I guess I'm following suit in some ways with my work on them. Um,
but not just about like my stuff on the beats and and I mean like the blog is meant to like bring access to like say just introducing people to who the women writers are but also just to bring access to anybody that's interested and Tumblr is a great space for that because it's a space where you know maybe a young 16 year old like female poet will stumble along this blog and be inspired by somebody like Elise Cowan who um, was an amazing poet um, and that matters like that's why any of this matters. It's not so much like the critical scholarly essay we're gonna write on Elise Cowan's poetry. Because it is important, I think, to, to, to help people learn what is available. Because sometimes you just don't even know where to start. And that's also part of what my blog is about, is um, saying, like, here's a, here's a place to begin, you know, and, and it's, and that kind of came out of a, um, because I have a lot of conversations with people where they seem genuinely interested and, and sometimes it's because they care about me and sometimes it's because, you know, they actually have an interest in, in be women. Most of the time they don't. <laughs> but they like at least if we listen to me go on and then they'll be like, oh, well how can I check them out? And then I send off, inevitably send like an eight page email and they just really were being nice. So the blog is now a way to sort of be like, okay, well here is a space to start, like look at it as much or as little as you like, and, and then go from there. You know, all of, the, all of the knowledge that I have available, I want to share it. I don't want to, I don't want to publish it in a journal that you have to pay to read. Like, um, if you're interested in my thoughts, I will give you them. You know, I don't, yeah, I think that transactional way of looking at it, it that was a good way to put it, is hugely problematic. I'm surprised it's the first time I've said that word because I get made fun of for saying problematic a lot. My dad always read to me. Like, my dad read to me before I could read, before I understood words, you know, like, and I remember him reading me, I named Raven after Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven because my dad, you know, loved poetry. And, I mean, I used to think my dad must be the smartest man in the world, like most kids do, but, and I thought he read the best books, and then I got older and became a lit major, and I was like, really, Dad, you read Tom Clancy? But, um, but my dad was a reader. He always was. And, and he made, at least me and Luke, readers. I mean, he read to all three kids equally, and Meg likes her Nicholas Sparks, but um, Luke and I both ended up being English majors. But I remember, I mean, every Christmas he would sit us all down and he would read us A Christmas Carol by Dickens. And it was over our heads, but I didn't care, you know, I sort of loved, and I always remember loving things that were too complex for me to understand, but I wanted to understand them anyway. Um, and, and maybe that came from being read to a lot. And my mom was a musician, and uh, my love of Bob Dylan probably comes from both parents because my dad liked Dylan, but my mom hates Dylan's voice. She's one of those, but she sang Dylan's songs. So she sang us songs like Blowing in the Wind when I was five and six years old, and, and Peter, Paul, and Mary, and Simon and Garfunkel, and these great story songs. And I loved stories, always did. And like, by the time I was old enough to write, I would write stories, and I would think about all those things. But yeah, I got read to a lot. My dad would read me Poe <laughs> when I was a child. Like, and I couldn't even read myself. And he read me like Hawk Frog and The Raven and these dark stories. And, and they let us watch anything like we wanted. They let us watch a lot of stuff that most parents would be like, oh my god, I can't believe you let your kids see that. Like, um, you know, we would watch B, we would go to the, the movies at seven and eight years old and rent all these B horror films. Sometimes that like had sexually explicit scenes and then parents had to be like, oh wait, don't look at that. But my parents were always big at talking to us. Like they wanted us to understand what it was we were taking in and they wanted us to talk through it. So they were always, you know, talking to us. Um, and I loved talking to strangers too. I was always a very friendly kid. So I would talk a lot to anybody that would listen and I would just ask questions. I wanted to know people. I, you know, I was curious. Um, I also just, I think as a kid too, I had a lot of ideas. <laughs> like, I mean, I remember, at seven years old, I went, I, I wanted to go to, like, I actually asked my mom if I could go to Bible school. I would go to school. Other kids went to church. I was like, hey, what's church? Like, I want to go to this. And so my mom took us to church and I went to Bible school for a little bit and then decided I didn't like it. But, you know, we ended up going to church for a while. And, and so, I don't know, I think I was just naturally turned to books because there were bigger ideas there. And I think I had a lot of, like, complex things in my head that most other kids weren't thinking about. Um, and I remember being in middle school and knowing that a war was going on in a way that my peers didn't seem to understand. Um, and like that wasn't their fault, but I couldn't conceptualize why they didn't get it. And I remember I read in middle school All Quiet on the Western Front for the first time. 
which is a book about war. And again, I just remember sitting down and crying because this was so, I couldn't imagine that this was happening. Like, so here's one individual story about one person experiencing war. And in my brain, I'm like, how many people are doing this right now? You know, like, and being 12 years old, and that was, that was what I was worried about. Like, and I wanted to be worried about the dance, like, and whatever boy I might dance with, but that just didn't seem important. And in school, I liked, I liked school when I was a kid. I liked being challenged. I liked seeking answers. I liked, um, and so it just fell in naturally because I didn't really talk to other kids. And I liked, like, the teachers would sort of have complex answers to my questions. I liked talking to my teachers. Um, and I liked doing the work because it was challenging. Um, I sort of became, I easily fell into like the stereotypes of school, being a nerd and a smart kid. And, and so once you sort of have an identity early on, you kind of, luckily for me, it became one that would be useful. And unfortunately, I think it's true in the opposite direction. Like kids who, who are told they're never going to be anything, I think it's just as easy to fall into it that way. But for me, I was lucky because I fell into that being, I was a good student and I was going to be a smart kid. And yeah, it made my, my experience socially difficult, but people always, they then always expected me to make something of myself. And, and I expected just as much from myself. And I think that kind of just drove me to be more successful as I went. And yeah, I think I, I remember being in middle school and my best friend and sister was in high school and I wanted to read whatever she was reading because I always wanted whatever was, was beyond me. I wanted to try to understand. Like I remember <laughs> the most exciting day in elementary school is when I could take two books out of the library. But I remember I would go to the fifth grade section when I was in like second or third grade because I wanted the thing that, you know, was probably too difficult. And it was. I would pick up books that like, I would pour through and I knew I wasn't really understanding but I liked the challenge and, and I felt like I felt like that was good for me. So when I was in middle school, whatever my friend's sister was reading in high school, I would read. You know, and I remember reading things that, like, I read Animal Farm. That's when I read All Quiet on the Western Front. I read 1984. And I remember my English teacher at the time being like, do you understand allegory? And I was like, of course. And then I went home and was like, what's an allegory? Like, and like, and, but it drove me to, like, figure things out. Um, and then, I, I, I don't know, I always feel like I was the better for it. And then it just, you know, opened up so many, you know, so many more books. Like, once you start reading, there's endless possibilities. And then college for me was, um, I mean, my classes were great. It was a, a class was, it mattered. And, and especially classes with Mitch and Kiskis, who just really, like, I mean, I would credit, and, and, and Charlie Mitchell, and I would credit for really shaping my thinking um, to be more like what it is now. But to put it on my right, what was so important was just the opportunities I had to, to like I was saying earlier, make things happen. Like, I feel like I've always sort of, um, I take naturally to like leadership roles because I, I just don't wait for someone else to do it. You know, like I kind of take a look at, and, and I don't know if that comes from that little bit of cynicism maybe that I liked so much in, in seventh grade, like thinking, well, like maybe this is the way it is, but this isn't the way it has to be. And if nobody else is going to do something about it, I am, you know, like, and, and that was something like, I mean, I started a club right away my freshman year in college. And I, I don't imagine like most freshmen are ballsy enough to just start doing shit. But, um, I think I was already confident in my, in my ability by that point, I mean, I was extracurricularly involved a lot in high school, too. Um, so I started, like, the Dead Poets Society. Short-lived, but it was fun. Um, and then, luckily, I fell in with, like, Jan Kather and Martha Easton and um, the Gender Issues group. And that shaped a lot of my experience. Because somehow, and I don't know where my feminism came from, but, I, I mean, I think by sheer fact of growing up female, Part of what you begin to realize is like, especially being a reader, is like, hey, these the people in these books doing the things that I care the most about do not look like me. You know, like they are they aren't me. They're they're male. Like they're almost always, like my heroes were men. You know, like Indiana Jones and Han Solo and and you know everybody in Lord of the Rings almost. I mean, Eowyn's a badass and Arwen's pretty cool, but but you know Frodo and and the the, the Nine of the Quest. They're men. And my best friend. Colin, I mean, he came out to me in 10th grade, um, and I actually got to watch, like, and I wouldn't have thought about it then in this way, but, like, I was beside him as he went through this whole process of figuring out who he was and taking a lot, a lot of crap from people, 
Um, and I think I probably learned a lot from that, and I think that's like some of where my feminism comes from as well. But also that, that I had that to that teacher in seventh and eighth grade. She's a reading teacher. Um, I mean, I think she's the reason I became an English major. And like, she's sort of that stereotypical like second wave chain smoking like feminist that you know I think kind of instilled a lot in me then, um, or at least gave me the language for it and the way to begin to think about it. And then. You know, like once I was in college, the roots of that were already there, and Elmira just turned out to be the perfect place because it was this kind of small, encouraging environment that allowed me to to connect with faculty and and begin to connect with my peers in a way I hadn't before. I mean, a space like WCW was great for me because here were like misfits of like these people like coming together who like I mean, and I think music works in a way very similar to the way I've been talking about books, but um, for people. So I think I connected in that way to a lot of people about about music, and you know that's why I met Kate and I met somebody like Bridget who were like my my older peers, yourself included, who were like inspirational like to you know, like driving and doing things and I, you know, you watch, you learn. And then by my senior year I got to do some really cool stuff. Like what I'm probably most proud of at the end is a lot of the stuff I did with the gender issues group that has sort of left like I got to direct the vagina monologues, which I think was a lot of fun. But I also was I got to do a lot of work in starting that Take Back the Night event, which still happens every year and I'm really proud of that. Um Yeah. Well and a lot of thanks is is to Janet and Martha on that, who were super supportive of students, but but also I had a really like good community of other students around me that, that helped. As much as it gets a bad rap, feminism isn't just about women. It's not just about women's issues. And I mean, that's sort of the way we, we approach it as women, because, you know, that's the best, I mean, we're the, the best way we can talk about it. But, you know, in challenging gender norms, you know, it's as much opening up a space for, for men to do the same with, with the way culture kind of shapes things negatively for them. Um, and like, so, I don't know, I think, I think if I was, I don't know necessarily that I think about myself as like somebody that's trying to bring feminism to other people. Maybe I should think about it. Like, maybe in college I was kind of, uh, you know, I was doing that with like the gender events that I was working on. Um, like, and one big thing, like, again, is that point about intersectionality. There just, there isn't one feminism. There's a, a lot of different ways to think about feminism. And so even between women, there are a lot of arguments and debates about, you know, like, our, our, whose voices are getting ignored and what perspective are you speaking from and, and, you know, it becomes really challenging. And then if you, if you worry too much about that, though, then it almost becomes so crippling you can't even begin to talk. So I think what the biggest point is just about acknowledging your bias and, and trying to understand like, you know, your privilege and where you're coming from and um and and, and really and really trying to listen to other people when they when they don't agree or they don't understand. Um and yeah, so I think it I think that exchange is where it becomes really important because yeah, I, I guess, like, sometimes I can come off as, like, off-putting so people don't even want to be like, oh, hey, like, I don't get it because you're afraid I'm going to tear your head off or whatever. But I guess one of the things that I at least like to think I, I would do, or at least I know I make it a conscious effort to do, is, is to, to respond in a way that is not, like, oh, you don't get it, you must be a terrible person. Like, but say, like, okay, what are the questions that you have? If the question is asked in the right way, like, people are going to be happy... To, to answer and I think a great example is somebody like Kate who has like really been um, like just putting out there like what it is like to, to live with her disability and really you know wants questions and wants you to understand as her friends and like some place like her blog is a place to just learn a, a lot about what her experience is like and it just takes the initiative of you reading that to begin to understand um, rather than being like you know, hey, what's it like to be you? Can you tell me, what, like, the experience of all deaf people? Like, clearly that's not not what's happening here. So I think it, it ha needs to happen on on both ends. And, like, part of it is is on, like, because so, I, like, as a feminist and speaking specifically about women's issues, is me, um, as a woman who cares about these things, being able to respond to questions in a way that, like, leads to a... a a positive conversation, but also like the hope is that that people take the initiative to to sort of to look into it themselves, you know, rather than sort of expecting I don't know somebody else to sort of explain it to them. Um, 
And like the thing is, like every time I come down on it, though, like I'm not, I'm not gonna stop being loud about things. I'm not gonna stop being angry about things because, you know, somebody needs to be. Like if we're so, cause like there, and and and. and I mean, if you there's a really good movie um, called Iron Jawed Angels, which is about um, fighting for the the right to vote, and there's these sort of two branches of like women fighting for it, and, and sort of the older generation are sort of doing this thing where they're sort of trying to infiltrate and schmooze the right people and, and get the vote passed sort of quietly, and the younger generation just starts, you know, they do the hunger strikes and they start raising hell and they they make a presence and they make it known, and like I would probably of that be of that camp. So I'm probably, you know, inevitably will get the rap from some people as, as being, you know, an angry feminist or, or whatever. But I don't really have a problem <laughs> with, with being understood that way. And I like to think that if I would, like, any time I was organizing an event or doing something like my blog that is meant for outreach, that it comes off in a way that is accessible. Um, but yeah, I guess, like, in a personal space, like, if it's on my Facebook or you know, like my Twitter, or, in, you know, at a conversation with me in a lunch table, like, it is, it may come off as harsh and off-putting, and, and, you know, people aren't always gonna like it or respond the best way to it, but I've, 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 I've learned that, you know, that's gonna happen no matter what, and if I start kind of just making concessions all the time, it sort of takes away, like, part of, who it is I, I feel like I am, so, um, I don't know. <laughs> I guess that's the best way I can respond to that. But I, I, I do think it's, I think one of the, one of the, the biggest problems is when we think, like, and this is sort of somewhere kind of where we started, so maybe this is a nice way to wrap up, is, is when we're, we're really attached to the idea of, of, of this is the way things are, or this is, and, and I think this goes back to that, that question about, you know, like, your question about feminism and stuff, too, is, like, if we have one idea about what feminism is, or about who can be a feminist, or, or how the movement should work, like, I mean, it's not going to get anywhere, um, so I think it is important that it's intersectional, and, and, you know, that there are gray areas, and, and that's a, both a challenge and a strength, I think, um, moving forward, but, and and so and like I was saying before, I think so much about it is perspective, and 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 I think. I mean, I I'm sure I have certain things that I'm very attached to. Like I will always love the movie You've Got Mail, and I get very upset when people criticize Lord of the Rings. But I like to think that I am somebody that like can step back and have a, have a conversation about criticizing whatever it may be. And I mean, I think that's one thing that gets annoying is because I am hypercritical of so much. Um, it's like, why can't we ever just sit down and watch a movie? But, um, but I think it's important to, to, to recognize that everything, you know, like, yeah, all the, the conversation always is always fluid. And, it, and if we approach it that way, then we can keep having the conversation, which is the point, right? Like, you know, we have to, we have to at least begin with the conversation. And, and, and I don't know, hope something, hope we can build something positive out of it. I think that's what, I don't know, I guess probably the best way I can define the, how I understand building communities. It's a lot, like, I, I, I think conversation, it, what I would use is a, almost a, a synonym for how I understand community. And, like, I, I, I talk about that a lot in literary tradition, too. Like, I think a lot of, like, you can look at a literary tradition and think about the conversation that these authors are having across time. Just in the same way, like, you could look at our cultural moment and see it as in conversation with the 1950s and, and beat women and, and like a lot of what I'm, I'm doing is in conversation with the way I understand what, what say Ginsburg was doing with his poetry um, and as long as like as long as we can keep having a conversation as long as we're not shutting each other out you know then we're making you know then something positive is happening you know it's, it's a good thing and I think part of that that so that's, I think that's related to like my concept of transience and, and you know, we're not deciding on the answer, we're talking about about it. And I don't know that it has to have an end goal, you know, of what it looks like. When like, I, I, you know, if we, if we think about feminism as an example, I don't think we're going to ever reach a point where we've all reached feminism or we've all, we, we've reached a moment where there's gender equality or, or everybody is 
Like, I think, I think it's always going to have to be a conversation and hopefully one where more people are involved and more of us are talking to each other and more of us are, you know, treating each other with respect, but I don't think, I don't know, I, I don't think it has to have an end goal. <laughs>